Hi, my name is Anya Keeler and I will be narrating the radiology of extremity fractures, also called the bare bones. Fractures are described in a fairly standard term, whether it's in a radiology report or in a discussion with a surgeon, and the purpose of this is to m avoid miscommunications. The basics of fracture description are listed below, and each term is then further explained. We will also show examples of each of the more commonly seen fractures, and then at the end, review the ones that you really don't want to miss. Fracture is sometimes represented by the symbol that you can see on the screen here, particularly on requisitions. So, description of fractures. The first thing we want to know is the location, which bone is involved. We need a description of the direction of the fracture, whether it's transverse, oblique, spiral, or comminuted. The alignment of the two fragments of bone need to be discussed, including the angulation, whether there's displacement of the fracture, shortening, or rotation. A description of the underlying bone is also important. For example, a pathologic fracture compared to a stress fracture. A pathologic fracture is a fracture occurring in an abnormal bone with normal stress, whereas a stress fracture is a normal bone that has abnormal stress on it. Description of open versus closed fractures is also important. Other things to describe include associated articular dislocations in the nearby joints, such as a shoulder dislocation and a fracture of the humeral neck. Other complications such as vessel, tendon, ligament, muscle, or nerve injury. Involvement of growth plates in the case of children. Involvement of joints is also important. And many fractures have eponyms, which means that they are named after the person who first described them or for some other thing that is reminiscent of what it looks like. It's not as important to mention this eponym as long as you describe the fracture, fracture properly. And it is nice to know some of the more common eponyms, such as a Coley's fracture, which is a type of wrist fracture. In terms of location, the first thing to describe is which bone is involved. Is it proximal, mid, or distal portion of the diaphysis? Is the epiphysis, the distal end, involved? or is there involvement of the metaphysis. Condyles are also important to describe. All of these descriptions do require some working knowledge of skeletal anatomy, so knowing which bones are around is important, and particularly things like the carpal bones as well as the bones in the foot. When describing the direction of a break, a transverse fracture is exactly perpendicular to the direction of the bone. Oblique and spiral fractures are as described on the images. Those are the most common. The information may be relevant to the mechanism of injury and may also give indications to look at other bones or soft tissues for additional injury. They also increase your knowledge in terms of likelihood of... So a simple fracture is a fracture where a single bone has been broken into two parts. A comminuted fracture is one where the bone has broken into three or more parts. The more parts, the more comminution there is. This is an example of a comminuted fracture. We have three portions to the fracture, as described. An undisplaced fracture is one which maintains its normal alignment. So on the first image, on the left, there is an undisplaced but slightly angulated fracture. The next image, shows a displaced fracture where it's completely overlapping. And the third image is both displaced and slightly angulated. And in this case, it is also slightly shortened because it's completely displaced, uh, allowing the two fracture fragments to get closer to one another by shortening. When describing malalignment state, the displacement of the distal component relative to the more proximal fracture fragment is what you are referring to. So for example, a transverse humeral fracture with 1.5 centimeters of lateral displacement and 40 degrees of lateral angulation implies that the displacement of the distal humerus is by 1.5 centimeters lateral to the or relative to the proximal humerus. As mentioned earlier, a stress fracture is an abnormal force on a normal bone.
for example, tibial stress fractures in marathon runners. Whereas a pathologic fracture is a normal force on an abnormal bone. In this example here, the patient has a lytic lesion in the bone and there is a fracture through it. The bone may be pathologic with a benign lesion or a metastatic or malignant lesion. Joint involvement is important to identify and describe because it may significantly affect healing and may lead to compromise of function if it is not well aligned. Any involvement of an articular surface deserves mention, including gap or step deformity along the articular. An open fracture implies that there is an overlying skin wound and this also changes management significantly because there is a direct path from infection from the outside environment to reach the bone and this can lead to osteomyelitis and long-term complications. As a result, treatment issues often involve antibiotic and debridement at the outset to prevent long-term complications. Clues for finding fractures. The first thing to do is to carefully follow the bony cortex and look for a linear lucency or area of buckling or deformity of the cortex. Look for soft tissue swelling and look for joint effusions. Displacement of the periarticular fat pads is very useful around the knee and elbow. Other complications that can occur can be malposition or poor healing, delayed union or non-union where a pseudo articulation develops. An infection can develop in an area of fracture, particularly in open fractures. There may be injury to adjacent nerve or artery. The muscle and skin can be damaged and early arthritis can develop around a joint which has had a fracture going into it. In the acute setting, if there is significant swelling due to a fracture, compartment syndrome may develop. This can lead to necrosis of the around surrounding muscles and is a, considered an emergency. Other complications include venous thrombosis either directly or because of stasis. Kids uh, require special consideration when looking at fractures. Children as they're growing have much more pliable bones than adults and thus the damage to the bones may appear different. The first type is the plastic deformity or bowing deformity. In this case, bone bends without actually breaking, and it's usually due to a longitudinal stress. The greater the force, the more likely that microfractures will appear on the concave side of the bowed bone. A buckle fracture means that only the cortex has broken, and it's not broken through like adults, but it's more buckled. It still requires casting and most often it occurs near the metaphysis where the bone is most porous and the cortex is thinnest. This is usually called a torus. This is an example of one of these fractures where there's been stress in this direction and the bone has buckled. There's no actual lucent line seen across the bone itself. A green stick fracture is a fracture on the convex size, side and bending on the compression side. The remaining bone may have to be broken to allow proper realignment. So in this example you can see on the apex of the area in question there is a fracture however on the concave side there is no fracture seen, simply bending. Children also have growth plates called physes which are important for growth. Fractures can go into this region and result in growth plate injury. The classification for this type of fracture is called the Salter-Harris classification and there are five most common types of fractures. So type 1 fractures So one mnemonic that I use is Mimi. So children sometimes think about themselves and they want everything for them. So type one is, you just have to remember that it's a widening. Uh, 
Type 2 is the first M, so that's through the metaphysis. Type 3 is through the epiphysis, that's the E. The second me is type 4, which is both through the metaphysis and the epiphysis. And type 5 is the opposite of type 1. So type 1 fractures are fairly uncommon. They require close reduction in casting and have a good prognosis. Type 2, which are through the metaphysis, are the most common and also have a good prognosis with close reduction in casting. Type 3, which is through the epiphysis, is not very common. It occasionally requires internal fixation because that piece of epiphysis may fall off and not remain in place. There is increased incidence of growth disturbance. Type 4, which includes both the metaphysis and epiphysis, has a fair prognosis and often requires operative reduction. And type 5, which is the type where there's been crush injury, has a poor prognosis and is often associated with poor growth and limb shortening. This is because the cells which are growing become crushed and damaged. So what type of fracture is this? You can think about it for a moment. Here's the metaphysis. This is the growth plate. Nothing going on through the epiphysis. So this is a type 2 Salter-Harris fracture. Children who are 9 months to 3 years old present with may present with acute onset of limp or refusal to weight bear. Often they have had a toddler's fracture and this is a fall which most often is unwitnessed and parents are unsure of what happened. It is a spiral fracture of the tibia and is often subtle. The initial radiographs may be negative and may sometimes only be diagnosed on follow-up imaging or nuclear medicine bone scan. This is treated with immobilization in a plaster cast. So now we'll cover specific fractures to the upper limbs. The upper limb includes the clavicle, the scapula, the humerus, the radius, ulna, the various metacarpals, and phalanges. Knowing the nerve and vascular distribution is also. So dislocations of the shoulder are fairly common. Anterior dislocation accounts for 97%, whereas posterior dislocations are fairly uncommon usually a direct force to the anterior shoulder or indirect force to the arm in adduction, flexion, and internal rotation leads to a posterior dislocation. So here's an example of an anterior dislocation. The first image on the left is an AP view and what we see is that the humeral head appears overlapped with the glenoid and is slightly inferiorly displaced. On the second view we can see that the anterior the humerus is no longer the humeral head is no longer articulating with the flat glenoid and it is anteriorly displaced additionally we see a hill sax impaction fracture where the humeral posterior aspect of the humeral head is caught on the anterior portion of the glenoid so one of the complications of an anterior dislocation is a hill sax impaction fracture basically the humeral head impacts against the glenoid and this may occur during the actual dislocation or during attempts to replace the head back into normal position. In order to see this you should internally rotate the arm to see the posterior aspect of the humeral head and then image it in the oblique lateral view. Other complications of anterior dislocation include recurrent dislocations the more dislocations you've had, the easier it is to do it again. Hill sacs lesions, which are impaction fractures, occur in 50% of patients with their primary dislocation. There can also be bank art lesions, or fractures, which are the associated fractures of the posterior glenoid, sorry, the anterior glenoid, in the exact place where the humeral head impacts the glenoid. 50% of patients under 40 years old who have an anterior dislocation may also have a rotator cuff injury at the same time, and this is up to 80% in patients over 60 years old. Vascular injury occurs more often with advanced age, and neurologic injury can also occur, mostly involving the axillary nerve, and 20% of patients who may develop significant arthritis 10 years or longer after a primary dislocation. The next fracture is a clavicle fracture. The mid portion is most commonly fractured followed by the lateral part near the acromioclavicular joint and then less commonly near the medial joint.
In children and elderly, the most common elbow fracture are supracondylar fractures, whereas in adults, the radial head is most often fractured. Radial head fractures can be quite subtle and difficult to identify, but they are important because they are often intraarticular. If there is clinical concern for a radial head fracture, a repeat radiograph is recommended in 7 to 10 days post immobilization. This is an example of a supracondylar fracture in a child. We can tell that it's a child because the epiphyses are not fused and some of the epiphyses have not even calcified yet. On the lateral view here, we see that there is an angulation posteriorly this way. And on the AP view, there is an abnormal contour of the cortex here. Additionally, comma, there is a joint effusion with displacement of the posterior fat pad seen on the lateral view. There's a dark area just behind the distal humerus. Radial head fractures are the most common elbow fracture in adults. Sometimes the only sign of the fracture is a joint effusion, and you can look for a sail sign. The sail sign itself warrants casting and re-x-ray in 5 to 10 days. The two arrows here show the anterior sail sign, which is the one on the right, and the posterior sail sign, which is the one on the left. These are very specific for joint effusion and are often associated with radial head fracture. Coley's fractures are common. It's an eponym for a fracture of the distal radius. Usually you get dorsal displacement or angulation with the dinner fork deformity. Most often it's extra articular, but there may be variants which extend into the radiocarpal joint. For this type of fracture, it's important to assess the displacement, the degree of angulation, the impaction or shortening, and any intraarticular involvement. Ulnar styloid fractures are often seen in conjunct with this fracture. So this top image is a Coley's fracture with dorsal displacement of the distal fragment. Compare this to a Smith fracture where the distal portion which is fractured is displaced inferiorly or volarly. These fractures tend not to heal as well since they tend to slip inferiorly and may require um, um, open fixation. These volar displacements are often uh, unstable as I Knowing the anatomy of the wrist is important for evaluation of the carpal bones. There are various mnemonics available. Uh, you can choose whichever one you like. So if we start here, this is the scaphoid, lunate, triquetrum, pisiform, trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. These are the bones of the wrist. Other than knowing the bones, we should look at the alignment. This is a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but it is worth knowing that there are Galula's arcs. Essentially, you should be able to see these smooth arcs between the various carpal rows and the radiocarpal joint. If these arcs are not seen because of overlap of bone, this is likely due to dislocation or fracture. The lateral view is very helpful. Scaphoid fractures are the most common fracture of the carpal bones. The most common is at the waist, 20% are proximal and 10% are distal. It's important to note that 70% are at the waist because blood supply enters at the distal pole, which means closer to the fingertips. So if there is a waist or proximal pole fracture, there may be AVN of the proximal bone as a result of this. This is an example of a patient who has a fracture at the waist of the scaphoid, and they are at increased risk of forming AVN, which means you'll see increasing sclerosis and eventually fragmentation of the bone. So if a scaphoid fracture is clinically suspected, but not seen on the initial x-ray, it's important to cast the patient and to repeat images in one to two weeks. Other options, if this is not a good solution, include using CT scan or MRI. Now we will cover some of the lower limb fractures. Again, we have the pelvis, femur, tibia, fibula, the various metatarsal bones, and the phalanges. It's similar to the arm, and it also has its own venous and vascular and nerve plexus. Proximal femoral fractures are fairly common in the elderly. Their location is described according to the femoral head, the neck, and the trochanter. There are capital and subcapital fractures, intertrochanteric fractures, subtrochanteric fractures, and of course fractures of the femoral shaft.
So capital and subcapital fractures have the highest risk of avascular necrosis. The subcapital fractures are often treated with cannulated pins, also called Knowles pins. If this fails, patients often have to have a prosthesis. Intertrochanteric fractures occur most commonly in patients with osteoporosis. AVN is uncommon, and this is usually treated with a dynamic hip screw, as you see on these images. Hip dis dislocations are more rare than shoulder dislocations. However, compared to shoulder dislocations, hip dislocations are most often posterior, whereas 10% are anterior. Hip dislocations are also much more common in patients who have had total hip replacements and you should always look for acetabular fracture dislocation. Here's an AP view of a patient who has a hip dislocation. It's a posterior dislocation where the hip is overlapping the acetabulum a bit and it's superiorly dislo dislocated. On the lateral view, where the patient's front is on the right side of the image, you can see the femoral head is posterior to the acetabulum. Next we'll cover the knee. The knee has numerous ligaments and menisci, and it's important to have some concept of the anatomy because several fractures in this area are often associated with ligamentous and soft tissue injury. Patients who should undergo radiography after knee trauma include the Ottawa and Pittsburgh decision rules. So the Ottawa knee rules include patients 55 years or older, patients who have tenderness at the head of the fibula, patients with tenderness of the patella, those who cannot flex their knee more than 90 degrees who were able to beforehand, those who cannot walk more than four weight-bearing steps in the emergency department, and those who present immediately after injury with significant pain. The Pittsburgh decision rules include blunt trauma after or falls as mechanism of injury plus either younger than 12 years old or over 50 years old, and inability to walk four weight-bearing steps in the emergency department. Osgood slatters is actually microevulsions of the tibial tuberosity caused by repeated traction on the anterior portion of the developing ossification center of the tibial tuberosity. This is where the patellar ligament inserts. It's more common in males, particularly in young athletes, and 25 to 50% is bilateral. It often presents with inflammation, pain, swelling, and this is a typical appearance of a patient with Osgood slatters disease they have these nodular areas or the tibial tuberosity. Along with the fragmented tibial tuberosity, either prominent overlying soft tissue swelling or significant clinical signs of Osgood Schlatter should be present to diagnose this radiographically. Uh, diagnosing patellar fractures and differentiating them from a normal variant called a bipartite patella is useful. A bipartite patella is not a fracture. The bipartite portion is usually in the upper outer portion and has well corticated margins. The extra pieces do not exactly fit back into their original parts compared to a fracture. If the fragment does not fit this description, consider a fracture, especially if it is a joint effusion. These are the types of fractures that can occur. Undisplaced, transverse, displaced, lower pole, upper pole, vertical, and comminuted fractures. The transverse fractures are more worrisome than the vertical fractures because the quadriceps tendon and the patellar ligament insert on either side of the patella and when the patient flexes the knee there's increased risk of non-union due to distraction of the two fracture fragments. So patients who have this type of fracture are required to stay in neutral position without any flexion. There are numerous classification systems for ankle fractures which are worth knowing in some cases. However, again, if you can describe the fractures and the fragments, as well as any possible associated soft tissue injury, that is the most important thing. Inversion injury can lead to avulsion of the lateral malleolus or their ligaments, whereas an eversion injury can lead to a crush injury to the lateral malleolus with a spiral fracture, as well as ligamentous injury on the medial side, which usually involves the deltoid ligament complex. So ankle fractures are the most common cause of trauma associated radiographic evaluation in ER patients. Supination and external rotation is the most common type of injury and disruption of the anterior distal 
tibiofibular ligament or distal fibular fracture with or without transverse medial malleolar fracture. Pronation external rotation, which is a different type of mechanism, can include avulsion of the medial malleolus, the anterior distal tibiofibular ligament, or a fibular fracture. Here's an example of an oblique lateral malleolar fracture which extends into the mortise. This is an oblique view that allows you to see the outline of a mortise. The next example is a bimalleolar fracture where we see a transverse fracture of the medial malleolus as well as a spiral fracture of the lateral malleolus. These have been internally fixed on the next image. Trimalleolar fractures means that three simultaneous fractures occur due to the injury. That includes the lateral and medial malleolus as well as the posterior malleolus which essentially is the posterior aspect of the distal tibia. Um, the posterior malleolus fractures are usually only seen on the lateral view because they are vertical fractures. Here's an example of a patient with a trimalleolar fracture. The arrow on the left is due to the transverse fracture of the medial malleolus. The arrow on the first image on the right is the oblique fracture of the lateral malleolus. And the lateral view where the arrow is seen shows the vertical fracture through the posterior malleolus. In this case, the mortise alignment is no longer satisfactory because the Taylor dome is laterally displaced with respect to the tibial plateau. TO triplane fractures occur in pediatric patients and make up 5 to 10 percent of intraarticular ankle injuries. The male to female ratio is 2 to 1 due to a later growth plate of the lateral tibial portion in males. Most commonly Males aged 12 to 15 present with this type of Salter hair forest tibial fracture. The sagittal fracture of the epiphysis, there's a transverse fracture of the lateral physeal plate, a coronal, and a coronal fracture of the metaphysis. And it often disrupts the tibial plateau due to its intraarticulation. So, this is an example of a TO fracture. So, we have a fracture extending through the growth plate, extending through the epiphysis into the plafond of the mortise, and there's a vertical fracture component. Calcaneal fractures are often sustained after falling from heights. These are called lover's fractures, apparently Romeo and Juliet type of situations where the, the guy would jump out when the Juliet's dad would come in the room. 10% are lateral. Le the lateral view often determines bowler's angle, and this angle is important to measure because when it is depressed, it means that in the case of a fracture of the calcaneus, surgical intervention is needed. CT scan may be helpful in these situations. Also, review the spine from lumbar L1 through S1 due to associated Don Juan compression fractures of the vertebral bodies, also due to jumping from a height. So I will show an example of Bowler's angle on the next image, but basically one line connects the superior margin of the anterior process and the posterior margin of the posterior articular facet of the calcaneus. The other line contains the posterior margin of the posterior articular facet of the calcaneus and the posterior superior margin of the calcaneal tuberosity. So again, we have one line here from the facet going to this portion. And then we have this tuberosity here to the top of this portion of the bone. And this angle should be between 20 and 50 degrees. If there's a fracture through here, through the middle of the calcaneus, the entire thing can collapse down and become flattened. That angle will decrease. Finally, I'll cover a march fracture. Often it's a stress fracture from military recruits Long, marching long distances, and it occurs in the metatarsal shafts, usually near the region of the So, in conclusion, fractures are common. There are certain don't miss fractures, which includes the scaphoid fracture, the radial head fracture, hip fractures in osteopenic patients, particularly the subcapital fractures, and Taylor neck fractures. If there's concern for any of these types of fractures, first look for joint effusions, particularly in the radial head fractures, look for point tenderness in the region of the scaphoid. The p inability of the patient to weight bear should be a consideration in hip fractures, and tailor neck fractures are best seen on the lateral view. If there's any concern, these patients should be casted and, re and repeat images should be obtained. Alternatively, and particularly in the case of hip fractures, which are suspected,
the patient should undergo a CT scan or MRI. I hope you've enjoyed this lecture, and if you have any questions, please come and ask any of the radiologists. Thanks.